Aloha, my name is Cindy Krosh, and I'm a retired veterinarian and an avid amateur astronomer. I'm also the sketching observing program coordinator for the Astronomical League, and this presentation is about sketching astronomical objects. If you're already zoning out because you're thinking, this isn't for me, I can't even make stick people, hold that thought. I know a lot of people are put off by the thought of sketching, but astronomy sketching isn't just for artists. It's for everyone, regardless of your level of observing experience or artistic ability. If you can make a pencil mark and smudge it with your finger, you can do this, and I will explain why you may want to. In fact, it's such an important skill for amateur astronomers that many of the observing programs in Astronomical League require it. And in 2014, a program dedicated to gaining experience doing so was adopted. The Astronomical League is an organization created in 1946 whose basic goal is to encourage an interest in astronomy. It includes greater than 300 amateur astronomy organizations and has over 21,000 members in the U.S. and internationally. A little history about astronomical sketching. Documenting observations isn't anything new. Humans have recorded observations for millennia. The left image shows a petroglyph dating back 40,000 years. Archaeologists once thought this group of paintings was just showing wild animals, but a 2018 study believes they actually depict starry constellations, dates, astronomical events, and even a comet strike. Further studies of cave art across Europe show people had a more advanced knowledge of the night sky than was previously thought. They understood some complex concepts, such as equinoxes, and they kept track of major events, such as comets and eclipses. The upper right image shows an ink on silk drawing of comet observations from the ancient Chinese dating back to at least 300 BCE and are some of the most extensive historical comet records in existence. The lower right photo is from a carved petroglyph from Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, possibly depicting a total solar eclipse and a coronal mass ejection from the year 1097 CE. Data shows that the sun would have been at near solar maximum at the time of the recording. After the invention of the telescope in 1608, sketching astronomical observations increased dramatically. In 1610, Galileo rushed to publish his 32-page Starry Messenger. This book was filled with sketches of his observations made through a crude refracting telescope. His publication was certainly the beginning of Galileo's trouble with the church, which eventually led to his house arrest for the last eight years of his life. And after COVID, I think we can all appreciate what that must have been like. Though Galileo was not the first to suggest a heliocentric model, his observations of the moons of Jupiter gave further evidence that not everything orbits the Earth. His sketches of the surface of the moon showed it was not a perfect sphere, but riddled by craters, and this also upset the church, who believed all celestial bodies were perfect because they were created by God. And I like to think of all the commotion Galileo must have created with his small telescope. John Herschel made very accurate deep sky sketches with an 18 inch speculum mirror. He used a method of triangulation to sketch features as well as calipers and grids to make precise measurements. The sketch shown here is his preliminary drawing of M8, the Lagoon Nebula. This sketch took him months of observations to complete and shows remarkable detail and accuracy when compared to photographs of the same object today. Can you imagine observing and sketching from a 20 foot focal length scope? You would be sitting way high up in the air most of the time. And besides that hazard, you sure wouldn't want to drop your pencil. Astronomical sketching was not without inaccuracy and bias. Since the eye of no two observers is the same, the same object looked very different in the hands of different astronomers. I really like this slide, courtesy of Howard Bannock from an excellent talk he gave in 2015. The slide shows six 19th century astronomers and their sketches of M1, the Crab Nebula. And I think you can appreciate there's a bit of variation in what each astronomer observed. 
Uh, some of the differences could be explained by remembering that they had different educational backgrounds in equipment, location, eyesight, and different recording methods. It's also important to note that observations were often used to support hypotheses, which further influenced what was recorded. By the end of the 19th century, the age of astrophotography was in full swing. The advent of deep sky imaging introduced further bias into sketching. Today, beautiful long exposure photographs influence what we expect to see when we look through our telescopes. The vast majority of astronomical discoveries over the past century are due in large part to astronomical imaging, but this in no way lessens the importance of scientific discoveries made by astronomers in earlier times using the tools they had at hand. These are some of the beautiful examples of modern day amateur astronomy images from Haleakala amateur astronomy members. And this just blows me away. So you may ask, if sketching isn't always accurate and we can take these awesome pictures, why sketch? While astrophotographs may bring out the beauty and detail of an object, they don't show what is actually observed at the eyepiece. Your sketch will provide a record of what you actually observed with your telescope and your conditions. Sketching requires only paper, a pencil, and a few other inexpensive items. In other words, it's cheap. Sketching can provide a permanent record of your observations. Details that may be difficult to put into words can be illustrated on paper. A sketch can bring back vivid memories of an observation in a way written words may not. There's a feeling of accomplishment at having created a lasting impression. And you may also surprise yourself that over time, your ability to record what you see improves. There's a sense of great satisfaction and a personal connection to the universe when sketching at the eyepiece. When you sketch an object, you make it your own observation, unlike anyone else's. It's also kind of meditative and relaxing. And maybe most importantly, rather than flying through an evening of observing, sketching does take time. It requires you to slow down long enough to record what's being viewed. And as a result, you will develop improved observing skills and see finer details. As an example, imagine a blade of grass. You look at it and move on, or you think about how you need to get the mower out. But let's stop and really look at that grass for say five minutes. You'll notice more details, such as the shape of the blades, subtle color and tonal qualities, and its structure. But who cares about grass? The point is that you can see deeper details when you slow down to observe and sketch astronomical objects and can record more information. Once you sketch something, you often remember it when you see it again. My early sketches were simple and quick, and many of them still are today, but I was interested in learning more about sketching at the eyepiece. So I joined a couple of online astro sketching forums. Seeing other astro sketches, I realized I could show more detail if I took more time. And after a lot of practice, my eyepiece sketching skills did improve. And along with that, so did my observing skills. The sketch of M35 on the left is one of the first sketches I did in 2010, and it was on scratch paper. The one on the right is from 2014. The point is, the more time I took to observe, the more I could see. The Astronomical League has over 75 different observing programs designed to help its members to learn more about different aspects of astronomy. I began to realize that an actual sketching program could benefit others. So in 2014, with the help of the Haleakala Amateur Astronomy Group, the Sketching Observing Program was created. The program was accepted and is now required for some of the upper level observing awards they offer. Uh, this is just a picture of our group from 2014. Okay, I'm kind of interested. So what do I need to get started, you ask? Well, the good news is you won't need to record on rocks like our ancestors. 
Uh, for fun, I tried this and it's really hard. All you really need is a pencil, eraser, and some paper. And these are a few other items that are helpful to have on hand. And I'll go into a little bit more detail in the next few slides. For paper, I like templates with an area to write about the observation and record other details. But you can make sketches on plain printer paper or in a notebook. And if you're not using a template, a minimum of three inches is a good size, but it just needs to be large enough to show the smallest details you observe. You may want to try some black paper with white implements. Some people actually prefer it for their observations. I personally like this method for doing lunar sketches because it seems a more natural presentation. With dark pencils on white paper, you actually are sketching the inverse of what you see, so stars are dark marks. But with the black paper, you record what you see without having to reverse it in your brain. An oversized clipboard with a Velcroed pencil is a great tip. I've misplaced or sat on many a pencil in the dark. Uh, red lights are necessary to see your paper and will help you to keep your dark adaption. And a rubber band will help to keep your paper from blowing around. Again, you can do everything you need to sketch with just a number two pencil, but these are just some other things that are useful to have if you want to step up your game. You can get a set of different hardness pencils inexpensively on Amazon or an art supply store. I also like General's Carbon Sketch Pencils for very dark marks. Graphite pencils are easy to sharpen with a sharpener, not so with charcoal pencils. The tips just break off. For charcoal, it's best to use a razor to whittle down to the charcoal core and then use an emery board or sandpaper to get it to a point. I keep a small chunk of charcoal for objects like galaxy, nebulosity, and globular clusters, and I like old-fashioned pencil end erasers because they have an edge. I also like erasers in a dispensing pencil like the one on the far right. Both are great for fine details. The kneaded gum erasers can be made into any shape, and they're just plain fun to play with. For blending, you can use your finger, cotton swab, cloth, or blending tortillon which is a tightly rolled piece of paper that comes to a point and is available at art supply stores. You can also use a soft bristle brush to apply charcoal in a more controlled way. The brush shown here is just a cheap makeup brush. I borrowed this one from my daughter's makeup kit and that's our little secret. Lastly, tracking is helpful for higher mag objects, but not required. This is a quick tutorial on sketching different types of objects. I'm going to start with showing stars in an open cluster, and I'm using a number of different pencils, um, using different pressures to get the right magnitude. I'm placing my brightest stars first to anchor the sketch, and then the fainter ones. And I'm twirling the pencil to get uh, the stars to look a little rounder. And initially, you want to make your marks light since you may want to erase something. And here I'm going to use a tortillon to smudge some of the stars so the edges don't look quite as sharp and gives them a softer, more realistic appearance. You can also use the tortillon to place some of the fainter stars. And if the cluster has some nebulosity, um, you can use your finger to dip into some charcoal laid down on a piece of scratch paper. You can apply the charcoal with your finger, cloth, tissue, or a brush. Um, I'm using my finger here to blend the charcoal, and I use all these techniques for creating bright nebula. If you need to erase over the nebulosity, it creates sharp edges, but just smooth over these with your finger. And for galaxies, I again lay down some charcoal and with my finger, I'm going to create the shape of the galaxy, uh, blending to taper the edges. And then I am going to just put a little bit more back to the core and um, where it's the brightest. I'm going to use a tortillon to add an even brighter area to the core and remembering you're working inversely here. So you're now sketching in your brightest area with the darker charcoal. 
Then using an eraser, uh, you can create your dark lane if one is present. And then you can clean up your sketch with an eraser or add some remaining features like field stars. For globular clusters, um, my favorite way is to use that soft brush uh, to create a really uniform looking cluster. Um, again, using that laid down charcoal. You can use your fingers or a soft cloth as well, but fingers sometimes make globular clusters look like fingerprints. Um, I'm lightly applying the charcoal before I dip the brush back in. And then I go ahead and make the edges fainter and go back in to deepen the core. Many globular clusters have kind of a mottled looking appearance. So I'm gonna use that kneaded eraser to just remove a little bit of charcoal. And I'm having a lot of fun with that eraser. Um, so here I'm just making a point to the eraser and dipping it in to remove some of the charcoal and then blending a little with my finger uh, before I add some stars to the field, uh, placing the brightest stars and then the fainter ones. And if I'm seeing a lot of resolved stars, I will use a stippling pattern with a pencil uh, to give that appearance of a dense cluster. I can then blend it a little with my finger to give it a more unfocused appearance. And that's it, voila. If you want to do more with your sketch, you can take a photo or scan them and use photo software to invert from white to black to give an eyepiece appearance. I have listed a few resources here, but there are many available. Uh, Photoscape is free and it's simple to use for PC and that's what I normally use. This web page is a wealth of information about sketching and it's listed on the Astra League Sketching Observing website. I highly recommend checking these out as well as looking around in a sketching forum such as Cloudy Nights. And you may want to practice some of these techniques before getting out. Now that we know a little about some techniques to try, let's give it a go. Okay. I'm now sitting at the eyepiece and I've located the object I want to sketch. The first thing I do is find my cardinal directions. And this is important to orient the sketch, but also if you want to compare your sketch to a photographic image or to another sketch. And this can also be useful to confirm you've sketched the correct object later on. I've had the experience of being unsure I had the right object while star hopping and later found I hadn't located the object at all, but sketched something else close by. To locate your cardinal directions, place your object in the center of your field of view. Turn off your tracking if you're using it and watch to see where the object drifts. The place the object exits is west. Mark this on your paper. Now you need to determine the other directions. Different types of scopes have different orientations when looking through the eyepiece. And I'm not sure why, but this used to really confuse me. So I hope this cardinal direction information is helpful. Uh, if you have a telescope with an even number of reflections, like a reflector or a refractor without a diagonal, North will be counterclockwise 90 degrees. If you have a refractor with a diagonal, an SCT or a MAC, North will be clockwise 90 degrees. Mark these on your sketch. I then spend some time observing the object before starting the sketch. Here I'm showing a fictitious eyepiece view on the left and my red light illuminated sketchboard on the right. One downside to sketching is that you will lose some of your dark adaption, even when using a red light. So having a general idea of the object before you begin is helpful. 
While looking in the eyepiece, imagine a grid lying over the field corresponding to your cardinal directions. This will help orient your sketch. And think about where light and dark areas are, how concentrated a cluster is, where the brightest stars are, and star patterns. Our eyes are very good at picking out patterns. On your sketch, your imagined grid will help fine tune where objects and stars are located. Lightly sketch the positions of the brighter and then fainter stars. You can go back and darken your stars and objects later when you're satisfied with their placement. You don't need to record every star. That's one thing that makes sketching at the eyepiece feel overwhelming, all those stars. Just record the stars that are most prominent or have a specific pattern that helps define the field. After I'm satisfied with star placement, I go back to my main object and spend some more time picking out further details like fainter stars, deepening a core, or adding nebulosity. And be sure to record the time, conditions, and what the object is. I once was so immersed in a sketch that I completely forgot to record what it was. So I recommend you do this first. After my evening is finished, I like to go over my sketches and remove any stray marks and fix star tails but I don't recommend adding more details you didn't see at the scope. It's interesting to see what you may have missed, but it's your observation, so don't change it. And above all else, remember, it's not a work of art, it's your observation, so have fun with it. Thank you for listening. I'll, I'll just say a couple of words about Bob. Uh, uh, most of you that are members of NOVAC are familiar with him by reputation at least. He's been an active visual astronomer and I'm, I'm not going to literally read this verbatim by word by word, but uh, he's been doing this for a while and he's used a heck of a lot, variety of instruments. Uh, some of us have seen that his telescope and mirror making classes that he has done and I'm very impressed by his Mars opposition drawings. And uh, he's certainly observed a lot more globulars than anybody else I know. And uh, Bob mentioned his personal brag is that he and Stephen O'Meara have made the first ever visual observation of gravitational lens. And I'd like to hear the story on that sometime. But uh, Bob, uh, do I, I guess I need to keep driving, don't I? Yes, sir. All right. So tell me when you're ready. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm Bob. I've like you mentioned, been doing this for a long time. I, uh, I on, on the other side of the house, um, I live over here in Bowie, Maryland, and uh, uh, I work. I'm, I'm an, I, I'm an I, uh, IT project project manager for NOAA, and have been working at NOAA for almost 20 years. First, the Weather Service, and in the last couple of years, NOAA satellites and our environmental archives. Um, sometimes there's some interesting intersections between uh, my hobbies and uh, and and, uh, and and my work. Um, go ahead, next next slide. Uh, I started off, you know, Paul had sent me Cindy's talk, so I had listened to it. And, and one of the things that Cindy said that uh, caught my attention was, and something I have preached when it comes to sketching or drawing at the eyepiece and, and, and maybe and, and cleaning up the drawings later on and making pretty, pretty versions of them, is uh, by drawing, I force myself to look more carefully. And I see more. It, it, it doesn't matter if it's deep sky or planetary. Um, when I when I drawing forces me to slow down instead of a ten second look at the whirlpool nebula, it's going to be more like a, a maybe a five minute or even a fifteen minute or even a twenty minute if, uh, a, a session at looking at the whirlpool nebula if I'm going to try to do something like make a sketch of su such a large and complex object. Um, I started drawing right away when I first started to observe in 1979. And I think that might be because I had other observers around me at the time who were also sketching. Of course, in 1979, we didn't have the wonderful technology like what we just heard about or even CCD technology. It was all film. And, and I actually spent five years as a photographer in the Navy and, 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 and uh, had a lot of ex ended up having a lot of experience with film and did a fair amount of astrophotography as opposed to astro imaging. Um, but I have always liked to sketch and I, and, and instead of showing my best, some of my best sketches or my favorite, some of the best sketches I've done 
or whatever in, in this presentation. I've actually tried to help it's helped to show some of my roots and and you don't have to be good to do this and and my number one comment i get back when i talk to pete when i when when i show somebody a, a sketch or i or i talk about sketching uh even in the field at, at an event or something people will say oh i can't draw well you don't really have to draw you don't have to be an artist you don't have to be an expert um really the primary reason to sketch is to keep a record for yourself um, and and I, I also find when I draw and when I sketch, it's it's natural to add some notes. Obviously, you're adding what you're looking at and maybe what type of telescope you're using, what magnification you're using, where you're at, um, uh, uh, that type of information. But you sometimes you find you 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 add additional information. And in fact, when I go back through my when I go back through, and I'll call this the log. When I go back through my logs that have my sketches in them. Um, I find all kinds of things. Uh, you know, I find, you know, I used to observe, I, I observe a fair amount of Tuckahoe State Park out on the Eastern shore because it's a pretty close site for me. Um, I will almost always write down when I hear barred owls and when I hear coyotes, and sometimes I hear fox. Um, I oftentimes will mark, I, I will remark if I see something like a, a bright meteor. Um, so it becomes a record. And since I've been doing this for a long time, it's sort of cool to go back and, and I'll, I'll touch on that later on, but it's, it, it, it's a way to jog the memory in, in some, and I think that it's somebody said, you know, it's, it's partly about legacy. Um, and, and here's a couple of, here, here's, here's an example. Uh, it's, it's, you know, and I'll talk a little bit about, well, uh, so 39 years ago, I'm observing with a four, Point five, a 4.25 inch, a four inch F4 uh, Richfield telescope. It was a, a the the telescope was that it was a kit that came from Coulter Instruments. If you can go back one slide, yeah, that one, please. Um, I happen to be in this case. I happen to be on an aircraft carrier that was in the Mediterranean Sea. This was a small telescope I could take on the ship with me and put on a tripod, and and uh, I could go up on the island structure of the aircraft carrier uh, on the side opposite of the uh, of the flight deck and and observe at 17 power with a 24 millimeter eyepiece. Um, it, it was inter it was challenging, but it was interesting observing. And at times the skies could be very very dark or very very bad. Um, there were nights that the uh, that that the glow from the ocean, from the plankton in the ocean, actually kept me from observing. But you can see in this, you know, it's a little tiny handheld notebook here that I was just, that I was just writing in real time, probably on pen. I would recommend using pencil. But you can see I was recording what I was observing, what objects, and I made this little tiny sketch of of M forty five in the lower right hand corner, and. I'm glad I did it. It was an extra. It was a, it was an excellent view of M45, and I could see the nebulosity. Um, it was just a really great view of you. It was good enough that I decided to make this cute, this nice little sketch. Um, and I'm glad I did it because it's the best view of M45 I've ever had. Uh, you know, using bigger telescopes and different locations and all kinds of different options, I've never matched this particular observation. Um, the next day, I actually made a better drawing of it. I, I took the, using this to jog my memory, and to I, I got out a piece of paper and I made a uh, I made a better sketch. I, I I better points as to where the stars are, and and used used my fingers to smudge the paper to sm smudge the the pencil and stuff. But this is the sort. This is the the, the actual source material for that. Um, the other thing I want to touch on is is. Uh, you know, like I say here, that the, the astro images that are created using things like the EV scope and 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 all this instrumentation that we see on the listserv and and on the on the Facebook page and all kinds of other places, is really phenomenal. And I love you know, it's love. It's great to see it. Um, it inspires me to get out. Um, but I also know, you know, I for uh, many years uh, there I couldn't have afforded some of that equipment. It just was not within my means um, between between uh, you know two kids in private school and and, and so and single income you know eh, that wasn't going to happen for me but I could always draw I could always sketch and and if you go to the next slide um, you know 
my, my sketching gear here. This is for many years. I just used a, a clipboard, just a masonite clipboard, a couple of uh, 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 some sheets of paper that I've printed to put through a laser printer or even a dot or even a, a, an inkjet printer with a, a form that I make in Microsoft Word. Um, and a couple of number two pencils and I'm off and going and I have a I have a similar I you know I'm I'm just recording what I saw and that's that's very similar to what people are doing with these great images now I tend to I sometimes I sometimes I display my drawings or, or put them out hopefully to maybe inspire some other people but um, a lot of times it's a record for myself um, it, it, it's it's an ability for me to to record what I saw um, and 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 get on to the next object or whatever. Uh, on the left is is a plastic uh, clipboard that I'm using these days that lets me store extra forms inside and uh, a couple of extra pencils. Uh, I don't get real fancy with my sketching. I don't have multiple types of pencils. They're just number twos, and I try to get new ones so I have good erasers because I, I make a lot of mistakes, so I'll erase a lot. Um, and and uh, and then also the enclosed one is nice because usually my usually the paper is a little damp from dew by the time I'm done drawing, especially if I draw. I, I've over the years I've learned that I prefer drawing two piece two objects on one piece of paper. Some of my earlier sketches some were, were based had I had a drawing I had a form that had six places to draw things. The cir circles were small; they were too small. Uh, so I moved to this format with just two of them, and they're probably about three inches across. Um, and and oftentimes the paper's a little damp by the time I'm done, so I can slip it back in here and help protect it. Um, when I'm drawing Mars, which is the primary thing I draw when I do planetary, I have drawn other planets, but um, really simple. It's an old vitamin. <laughs> it's it's a lid to an old vitamin jar. Uh, I, I push push down on a I press down on a regular on a regular piece of paper out of my printer and draw a circle with pencil you can see it's about two and a quarter inches in diameter uh a uh, really a mistake I, I see a number of novice planetary observers make is to make the circle too small or to make it too big so you want to experiment and see what works for you i have found about two inches to be about right give you enough workspace to see if you do see really great detail you got workspace to work on it um but it's not so large that you have too much space to work in Next slide, please. And I, I typically have an approach that um, I will make. I will make a sketch at the eyepiece. I use a very. I use a red light that I can dim. It's uh, it's a very simple light that you can get from Orion telescope. It's a little. It's the little rectangular black ones with the little potentiometer on it. And I will turn that all the way down, and uh, I, I will hold it against a clipboard so that this is a little bit of red light shining where I want to draw and I'll make my dots and and do an outline of especially if I'm doing deep deep sky do an outline of where I think where I think the nebulosity uh, or, or where the faint fuzzy is or if I'm do, doing a star cluster or something like that I'll make a, I'll make all the little dots I need to make and I'll, usually the next day I will try to get back to my drawings and fill them in and make them look nicer and and smudge out the details and stuff but i i don't try to do that detail type of stuff at the eyepiece that would probably take too long and the lighting's not good enough to do it anyway um the to go back to you know okay so in 1983 i'm looking at m8 here and how many times did it take me to get this i and this is actually drawing with pencil but i still felt the need i made I made a rough circle. I started to draw the star to, to, to dot the stars as to where they're at. And I went, that's not right. And I scratched it out. And I did that twice before I got to the point where I, I did I did a, a better drawing that uh, that was was good source material to, to, to work out the next day. And on the right hand side is an image I showed before from 1984. But you can see where I started to draw a low power, uh, a low po power view of Saturn, uh, I mean, of, of Jupiter, but I scratched it out because I realized the higher power view was going to show basically the same detail in this particular case. So, so if you're not a, if you're not a uh, if you're not an artist and you don't think you can draw, this is this is how I started. This is how you can start. You're gonna get you get better over time, but you know you can 
that's the wonderful thing about drawing is you can just, you know, if you don't like it, you can scratch it out and try again. Next slide, please. Um, planetary sketching is something I've, I feel like I've gotten pretty good with, especially with Mars. It's, it's one of my loves. Um, in this case, I am showing some nice draw. I've got some some drawings here that are ni very nice ones that I, I did probably in two, two, I want to say 2016 or something like that. Um, during one of the better oppositions with a set, this is with a, a, a my 20 inch telescope stopped down to 17 inches. Um, it, it's a little bit, it's quite a bit different uh, than uh, planetary sketching is quite a bit different in my opinion than, than, than deep sky sketching because um, it's important to let the telescope cool down. It's important to spend a lot of time looking through the eyepiece because you're waiting for that moment of really clear seeing. I will typically with Mars when it's fairly large, I will literally in my mind's eye uh, divide the divide the planet up into either uh, four sectors or more sectors, depending if it's a, if it's really close to opposition and larger. And I will stare at the upper left hand corner, and I will wait for that moment of good scene. And when that when it flashes for five or six seconds, you know I'll I'll try to sketch I'll try to rough in on the, with the pencil what I saw in that area. And then I will move to the upper right, to the upper right hand corner. And I, I will move, you know, so I'll look at small areas on the planet. Uh, and this takes a while. So it takes, it, it can take 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, sometimes 30 minutes um, to, to see as much detail as I can. Uh, it, and and I, I notice I'll go, I'll go to various events and people will, you know, observe, somebody will point the telescope at a planet and they will, look at it for 10 or 15 seconds and say, Oh, that's nice. And I, in my, in, in my own, in, in my mind's eye, I'm like, Oh man, you need to spend a lot more time looking at it. Cause you, you gotta wait for that moment of good scene. But as it, this patience and waiting and trying to capture that fine detail, it makes you a better observer over time. Next slide, please. Um, and memories and uh, a, a legacy and a record of what you saw. So uh, in 1983, I'm on the aircraft carrier. Uh, I have gotten off my day shift job. I've walked to the fantail of the ship and partly just to watch, so partly to get out and see some sky and to see breathe, breathe some breathe some air as opposed to the air inside the ship. And I knew that there, you know, there there's Venus. There would be Venus, there would be a, 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 a crescent moon, and there would be Jupiter and Saturn in the sky. So I walked to a, I went to a section of the ship where I where well I stuck my head out, so what direction the ship was moving, and then moved to, went to a, a part of the ship where I knew I could see this 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 happening in the sky. Um, the sky still twilight, the sun has set, but there's still red and an and orange glow in the background. And as I'm looking at it, here comes this like really bright bull eye, just right right through the scene. And it was awesome. Um, so I I trotted back down to my workspace and pulled out a piece of paper and a couple of color pins and made this sketch, made this drawing. And it's nothing fancy. I recorded in my, you know, I recorded from memory where I saw the planets and where I saw the moon and what the horizon looked like and and used the red pin to emphasize where, where the sky was still red and the rough direction and speed and uh, rough direction and length of the tail from, from the bolide. And, and even sketched in the the the, uh, the railing on the side of the ship. But in hindsight, I can go back and look, you know, that, that's an event I would, you know, many years ago that I would have forgotten. But from time to time, when I look through my log books, I find this drawing um, and, and it brings me back. And it's like, wow, I would have forgotten about it. Um, e e even if it was a file, on a computer somewhere, there's a pretty good chance I would have forgotten about it unless I somehow was walking through, looking through all these files. But, you know, I look at that and I, I hear the noise of the ship. I smell the kerosene from the jet fuel. Um, I can even, re, you know, and even, even I can remember after I made the sketch, I went up to one of the, I, I, I went up to one of the mess decks and had a couple of hamburger sliders. Um, so it's, it's just a great aspect of keeping, of keeping the memories, of keeping the legacy. Um, I, I'm wondering if I missed a slide somewhere. Just go to the next slide. Yeah. You know, I, ha I have looking, let's go back. 
uh, one more, one more, this one, yeah. So this is this is actually sitting on my desk on the left hand side. Is is you know it took me. To, I recently, I, I last month. I finally, I finally finished drawing all of the 400 Herschel one objects. I started this project a decade ago. Um, I had, I had, I had taken on a decade before that, more or less. I had uh, about eight years before I decided that I was going to do the ARP galaxy list that, it, that the uh, Astronomical League has. Um, and it was because I knew it was a list of challenging objects. And I said, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to sketch them all. So I sketched all 225 or so, 238, whatever it is, uh, ARP objects. And as I was finishing them up and I had time left over, I could, you know, there were parts of the sky I had observed all the ARP, ARPs. I said, well, you know what? Now that I've, you know, I'm going to finish the ARPs, I'm going to do the Herschels. So I made the Herschel objects. I, I drew all the Herschel objects. Well, this took me about a decade. I finished last month. It's like, whoa, well, now I've got this clipboard full of drawings and I need to go through them and, and sort of catalog them and, and organize them a little bit better and send them out to whoever the Astronomical League coordinator is and see if I can't get listed as, as, as get, get the Herschel 400 observing badge. Um, and as I finished up, as I got further along in the Herschel objects, I started to also draw the Herschel 4, the Herschel 2 list. Um, so Right now, so sitting on this clipboard is about 400, and the Herschel draw is the 400 Herschel drawings, and about another 200, uh, about 100 of the Herschel two objects. On the right hand side are the are, are the notebooks of my 40 years of of logs and sketching. Um, so it's, it can be fun to go in and pull them down and just sort of page through them. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, it will be pretty interesting to see what happens to these after in years to come or see what happens, see what, what my kids will do with them. But uh, I, you know, it, it's been an interesting experience. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, I love observing. Uh, I, I, I love observing with my Mark I eyeball. Uh, I was blessed to first use a CCD camera, believe it or not, in 1988. And, and I, once I started to use a CCD camera, I said, I'm never going to go back to film again. But the CCD camera technology was taking off so fast and I wasn't going to keep up with it. I figured I'd focus on, 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 uh, on the visual observing side and, and uh, get, out, get everything I could get out of it. Um, so anyway, I can open the floor to questions. Yeah, I see Mary's comment. That's exactly correct. <laughs> they, 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 you know, you, oh, I can't draw. I can't, can't draw. You know what? Drawing astronomical objects isn't that hard. It may take a little bit of skill to make a, a really nice, pretty, pretty drawing. But for just recording what you saw, it's it's uh, it's not hard. So I guess back to you, Dan. Can I just quickly ask how you, I know you're doing the Herschel 400 or whatever, but when you're not doing one of those challenges, how do you choose what to draw? Um, well, I, I, I don't get out as much as I like. That's a good question. Uh, if, I, 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 if, I, if I'm set up and I decide that I don't want to draw, um, I, I have a, 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 a term for that type of observing that, uh, that, that is, is, goes way back with some friends is like, I'm going to slum, I'm going to slum observe, you know, and, and usually that means pointing a telescope, which is off. Uh, most of the time it's my 20 inch, you know, I'm going to look at the planetary, I'm going to look at the Messiers, um, you know, and I, you know, we, we, we jokingly referred to that as slumming. Um, the, uh, I, I I typically will not draw. I may not draw something unless something really catches my. Especially those objects tend to be I'll have a lot of detail and they're hard to draw. So um, they're harder to draw. So I I may not draw them unless something really strikes me. It's like wow, this is a really good view. Aloha, my name. Ah, someone got they got it working. Um, or uh, or or if somebody or if something has come along that's different, maybe a comet. Maybe it's an event. 
of some sort. Crush, and I'm a retired. Um, so I, uh, that, that will, uh, you know, that's, that might be what triggers me to draw something, but for the last many years, I've mostly just been focusing on various observing lists. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. I'm not going to go over all my presentation uh, material because I want us to have time for some discussion. Uh, so I'll skip this. Uh, I, I will say uh, something Cindy hit and Bob as well is the whole point of sketching is to slow down and force yourself to observe. Yeah, it should be fun. I, and But uh, as, as Cindy was mentioning, the relative perspective is really more important for this kind of draw, drawing than precise rendering. As, as an example, look at Galileo's drawing of the moon. Okay, I have never seen those features on the moon. I'm sorry, I've looked at the moon a lot. And Galileo is you know, uh, one of the saints of astronomy, yet uh, he really did a crappy job of drawing the moon, if, if you want a precise, precise drawing of the moon. But he was getting some relative features, and nobody else had done it to that point. So let's, we'll give him credit for that. Uh, Rod Melise, I uh, Rod spoke to the Star Party a few years ago, and he, he did talk about sketching. And I, Rod and I talked a little bit, and he said that this is really his three-step approach. Uh, he does a rough sketch at the scope just trying to get some key points, kind of like Bob was showing some of the things he had done. Then later he uh, he, he uh, did a redraw and freshed it out. And that's really what Rod uh, recommends. And Rod likes to turn his stuff into, uh, he scans it and then he actually inverts it. So you have the black on, you have the white, white on black instead of black on white. I'm going to go quickly through this. Uh, of course, this is uh, recorded on the uh, YouTube, or you can take a picture of the screen if you want that, that link there. Uh, catching, getting the ordinal directions. Cindy talked about that in some depth. Some people like circular graph paper for their early, for their rough sketch at the scope. I haven't tried that. Uh, might work for you. Um, I love this quote by Betty Edwards, who, who wrote a magnificent book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. And she says, drawing is not very difficult. Seeing is the problem. Uh, and uh, one thing I do want to just, I'll skip over the rest of this, but I had a brother-in-law who's an art professor, and he explained to me once that uh, for someone who's not trained as an artist, one of the most difficult things is learning to try to draw what you're actually seeing instead of what you know is there. And that was certainly a problem I had in trying to do the sketching of the scope. I'm looking at an object and my brain is filled with all these facts and figures about what that object is composed of. And I'm not actually seeing that. I'm seeing patterns of light and dark. And, and, and you know, I'm trying to draw things that my eye is not actually seeing. And so it's, it's kind of learning to kind of relax and and actually see that you're seeing primarily your variations in shadings. So draw what you see, not what you think is there. Uh, Bob talked about just don't overthink it. And it's an important, do you want an outline? Do you want some sketching notes or do you want a, a very detailed rendering of an astronomical object? Uh, primarily, I want something that will uh, remind me of what I saw. I want to slow down and observe it. Um, and I have found, as I looked at other materials, for example, there are templates all over the place. Every, it seems like every group has multiple templates. The Royal Astronomical Society has templates for sketching. Uh, British Astronomical Association does. Uh, Astro League has over 90 different uh, observing programs. They have dozens and dozens of different templates. They have not standardized on a template. So, you know, uh, find a template that you like. If you're going to submit it to Astronomical League, you probably ought to use one of theirs. But uh, the big thing is the world's full of planners and very few people that actually execute, so uh, work on it. I, I will mention Brad Payne is, is the Novak Astro League liaison. So if you have any questions about the Astro League sketching programs or any of their other award programs, um, have a conversation with Brad. Cloudy Nights has a monthly sketch, has a sketching forum, and they have a monthly competition. Uh, great tent, uh, advice there. 
uh, Mary, who is still online, I'm going to ask her to <laughs> jump in here in a second, but uh, she has some incredible sketching videos, which she does. I, Mary, I will characterize that uh, a, a lot of your stuff is more in the terms of magnificent art pieces as opposed to a quick sketch at the eyepiece, but, but you can explain that. Um, and I think at that point, I, I want to stop presenting and let's have some discussion here. So, any questions? Mary, do you want to say something about your, your stuff? Um, yeah, I kind of um, flit around between doing eyepiece stuff, sometimes on black paper, sometimes on white. Sometimes it's in a little book, sometimes it's on loose paper. <laughs> and other times I just copy from photographs and create kind of works of art from it. So I don't really have um, a kind of solid method. I just go with what I'm in the mood for that day. So it's quite chaotic in the way that it's planned sometimes. But I, you know, I honestly think that even if you only ever try to sketch at the eyepiece one time, it will make you a better observer because you'll suddenly learn how to look properly and not just look at something like you say for a few seconds and skip off to the next thing. And that is such a valuable thing to have as a visual astronomer. Even if you never sketch again, just do it once because it will help you. I, I am awed by uh, Bob's uh... 30 year collection of sketches. I've sketched for over 30 years as well, but it's been very haphazard for me. I haven't done it systematically. But one thing I will say, I, I did a lot of uh, astrophotography back in the bad old days of film in the, in the 80s and early 90s. And uh, if I look at photos I took then, I, I remember looking at a guide star for 45 minutes. I do not remember the object. If I look at the sketches I made at the same time, I vividly remember what it was like, the sketch, because it forced me, like like the blade of grass, it forced me to look at the subtleties and all that. And 30 years later, I still have memories of looking in the eyepiece and seeing that object, where the photos, the astro imaging I've done, no, it, it's, it evaporates. Yeah, I mean, you, I really enjoyed the binocular talk earlier, but it, it reminded me of drawing Eddie's coaster. And I used to be a massive roller coaster fan before I injured my back. So Eddie's coaster was one that I really wanted to do. Kemble's Cascade and the coat hanger. I just remember so vividly looking at these through the eyepiece while I drew them. And I photographed them countless times, but it's the drawing that you remember, like you say. Other questions? I, I know we're, we're just a little bit over time, but we're the last session, so we can afford to stay on a couple of more minutes, maybe. But any other questions, Chris, yeah. Paul? Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead, Paul. Oh, I was just going to, I'm, I'm really curious. Uh, I admire people that can drive and draw and, and do diaries and all this kind of stuff. The thing I've often wondered about, and uh, I've got a huge trove of photos that I've done over the years, I keep wrestling with how to archive them and generate the correct metadata so that it'll be useful in the future, not only to me, to, to but whoever else is interested in any of this body of work later on. So, Paul, I, yeah, I saw your question in the, in the chat, and that's actually a really good one. Um, I haven't tried to do anything with my drawings and my logs other than uh, 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 other than just casual, literally casual pictures with a phone. Um, like what I did, what I showed today. Um, if I were to do something to this effect, I would probably um, look at the librarian and the museum communities. Um, one of my other hobbies is railroading, and I'm on a bulletin board system. And the railroad, the the, the people who run the railroad museums, are, have spent a tremendous amount of time discussing and looking at different methodologies of of preserving. Uh, uh, digital digital copies of both written and images, you know, photographs, and what software, what formats, because uh, the, you know the forever challenge of of putting anything electronically is, you know, the 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 gift of yesterday is not the JPEG of today. Um, I do have a friend who is an early Novak member. Uh, Brent Arkenall is probably still he lives out in Arizona these days. I observed with him for for many 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 years, and Brent had this hot had this habit that I never got into, 
that he at the uh, the next day when he was when, after observing, he would sit down and he would type out his his his, his logs into the computer and he saved it as one big massive text file, a nasty file, which you know anything will read almost anything into the you know into the future. Right. I, I will say that that's that's something that I learned by watching uh, Cindy's thing and and also listening to Rod's uh, comments that I basically what I've done in the past whatever I recorded at the IPs that that was it. And going back the next day and polishing it up, I, I, I kind of felt like that was cheating. And uh, now I not so much. I mean, if you can clean it up, it, it, it actually means if, if I just do the outline at the scope and then I follow it up a little bit later, then, then maybe I can uh, enjoy more objects that way, too. Um, the thing that I've done with my sketch is absolutely everything I sketch gets photographed or scanned and it's on my Flickr page and I type in the description what uh, just basically my observing notes and everything is hashtagged so rather than go to my folder which is in absolutely no order whatsoever it's just a hot mess some of it's taped into my observing diary some of it's loose like I said so um, what I do is go to Flickr and just search for the objects when I, because I always remember whether I've drawn something or not. And um, the downside to that is if Flickr ever goes under, I have lost everything. So <laughs> it's not a fail safe system, but um, because a lot of my stuff is pastels, they dull very easily. So they get photographed, put in a folder forever and never come out again, or they go in a frame and go on the wall. So it's kind of sad, but the digital pictures are beautiful and I get prints done of that and have a folder with prints of my artwork with me when I go to outreach events and whatever without the fear of them getting stolen or somebody oh. spill coffee on them or you know so yeah it's kind of sad that the sketches never see the light of day again unless I'm re-photographing it for something but having that digital copy on Flickr has been really useful for me so much so that I've ended up having to pay for the pro account <laughs> because they've really got me now yeah. Paul, did you have a question or comment? No, I was just saying that's a really great idea to hashtag your own documents. I've, <laughs> it's it's obvious that that would work, and I never really thought of that. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, I do it with my photography as well because I just get so lost otherwise. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, my uh, great grandmother was the state historian of North Dakota, and I had inherited tons of genealogy records, and I've been using genealogy programs and augmenting with those that way i get the writings of everything that i've inherited base uh, put with the people but but even finding it is 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 tough and hashtagging it is uh, is you know should work i'll think about that that's a great idea thank you you're very welcome i hope it helps somebody else that's listening because it certainly helped me right and i would imagine dan and those of you who are doing all the these beautiful sketches of astronomy things if that's baked into some sort of genealogy program your ancestors would love that i uh I, that's a great idea as i sit with my my two-month-old granddaughter now and i'm thinking about what astronomy is going to be like for her you know, in the future you know, i need to do more of that i i do, i am sensitive to the fact that it's a little past her time yeah, these will be posted on the website uh, on the uh, YouTube channel. I do encourage uh, everyone to visit Mary's, uh, her YouTube channel, some amazing uh, t short tutorials of her doing pastel drawings and paintings, as well as many other topics. Uh, and I, I want to remind people, when you go to the Star Party this year, there will not be a lot of physical paper handouts. Uh, so print off the forms, the, the uh, binocular challenge forms, things like that, before you go up into the mountains of West Virginia. It's a wonderful observing site, but not so much for using te technology to connect to the internet or whatever. So bring those with you. Uh, Chris, anything else we need to bring up before we close out? No, I just want to thank you, Dan and Mary. Thanks for sticking along. Um, Bob, Paul, Chris, and the gang that chim chimed in today on the presentations, they were excellent. And very, very, you know, very, uh, very good for us and look forward to doing this again. In